Today's Palm Sunday uh, in, the, uh, in the liturgy of the church around the world, commemorating the, uh, the week uh, before uh, coming up to Good Friday, uh, crucifixion of our Lord, and then the Resurrection Sunday. Uh, tonight, looking at Zechariah, you're going to see a prophetic passage in Zechariah spoken hundreds of years before Jesus came, telling them that their, their, their Savior would come riding on the foal of a donkey. I want you to come look at that tonight. It's Zechariah, by the way, is, is called the little m major, capital M minor, the major minor prophet. It's the longest of the minor prophets. It has uh, more messianic references than any other prophets than Isaiah, second only to Isaiah. Hope you'll come back tonight and we can have a good time gazing into that. But this morning, we're looking at 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through chapter 11, verse 1. This is, these, are, these are final thoughts, final considerations on this topic we have been considering for several weeks now. Christian Liberty, your bulletin for several weeks has had, has had a picture on the front of it of a field with a fence reminding you of what Walt Chantry says in his excellent book, uh, Shadow of the Cross, Studies in Self-Denial. I commend it to you to get it and read it. Reminding you that when Jesus Christ saves, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You should be truly free when you come to faith in Christ. Until that time, by the way, until that time, there are a lot of people who think they're free, they're running around, but they're in bondage. They're in terrible bondage, bondage to sin and death and hell. When the sun comes, though, and the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, is applied to your life by the Spirit, then you are free. And in your freedom, in this vast field of freedom in Christ, there is a fence, and it's called the fence of self-denial. We've had that on the bulletin now for several weeks to pictorially remind you that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that is your life. That is your life should be our lives. And that's tough. We live in a culture that is self-indulgent, self-centered, self-gratifying. It's all about self, self, self. And Jesus steps on the scene and says, oh, about that self thing? Deny yourself. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. We're going to read from there through chapter 11, verse 1. I would remind you the chapter breaks in our Bible are, are superimposed after the fact. And if you read the Bible a lot, you realize that they get 90-something percent of those chapter breaks right. This is one where they didn't get it right. We're going to read down to chapter 11, verse 1. Stand with me if you would. Follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you. We read these summarizing considerations. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's a citation from Psalm 24. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, 
not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And we're studying this, not only because it falls sequentially in what we're looking at in 1 Corinthians as we go through 1 Corinthians. We're studying this because chapter 11, verse 1, Paul puts the matter squarely on the bullseye. We are to be imitators, mimites, mimics of leaders who are mimicking Christ because all of us who call ourselves Christ followers are becoming increasingly conformed to the image of Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, Paul is uh, bringing this discussion that's really been going on since chapter 8, verse 1, on the question posed about how the believers in Corinth should respond to the presence and opportunity of eating food sacrificed to idols. He's bringing it to a close finally. And so he kind of goes back over uh, some of the more salient points uh, that he has made, chapter 8, chapter 9, and the better part of chapter 10. And he states what uh, my professor Curtis Vaughn in his commentary calls these great comprehensive principles by which all questions of conscience are to be resolved. And so you take this specific issue and you draw out of it moral, spiritual principles that apply to us today. And I say that because the devil's a liar. And he's going to sit there talking to some of you. You may have been doing it already as we've gone through this in several weeks and say, man, what's this? Y'all aren't you eating food sacrificed to idols. What's this all about? That's the, that's the issue. The principles we're looking at to show us how we live in liberty in Christ. There are three fundamental principles that come out of this passage, which is summarizing the whole matter. First, in conducting ourselves, we need to do so for the good of other believers. Secondly, for the glory of God. Third, because of the example of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to unpack this passage, keeping those things in mind. You see, when you got up this morning, in your lenses, in your, in your screen, there should have been some principles operating. What I'm thinking about doing, will this be to the good of other believers? Will this glorify God? Will this exemplify Jesus Christ? That's got to be, if you're, if you're familiar with computer ease, years ago when I first started uh, playing around with a computer, I won't tell you about the first time I did that, my first computer, uh, I sat up all night, literally looked at Karen the next morning, bleary-eyed, and I said, I think I've made a terrible mistake <laughs> getting this thing. But we've come a long way since then. But there's what's called a TSR. A terminate, stay resident program. If you're in the Windows environment, Windows is a TSR. It's always operating in the back. If you're in a Mac environment, it's a TSR. It's always operating, always operating. You don't, you don't see it. You don't see this on your computer screen. Windows is on. Windows is on. Windows is on. But it's always there. Well, that's what these principles are to be. TSRs in the Christian life. The good of other believers the glory of God, the example of Christ, always operate in the background, informing and influencing everything that we think, do, or say as a Christ follower. So let's look first of all, this principle of concern for others, chapter 10, verses 23 to 30 says, all things are lawful. He's, he's, remember now, he's quoting what has been sent to him. Paul, since all things are lawful, he says, all things are lawful but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up or edify. That no one seek 
his own good. He's not, he's not there saying that we should never think about our own good. It's, it's, it's not a call to neglect. The emphasis here is you put the good of his neighbor above your own. That's called self-denial. So eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. If you're a follower of Christ in Corinth, you don't go in and say, no, I'd like to get that meat, but eh, where'd that meat come from? He said, it's meat. Buy it in the market, take it home, eat it. He says, because before it was <laughs> dedicated to idols, it's the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's uh, Psalm 24. The world and all that dwell therein. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, eat whatever's set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. If you, if you go into the home of an unbeliever, don't then start messing with his or her home, expecting them to adapt and accommodate you. You are in their home. And you should be there evangelistically, by the way. But if someone says to you, and this is interesting, these commentators here think that there, there may be other people in there, and, and, and one of them acts sort of as an informant, almost baiting, it, this has been offered to sacrifice. Then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informs you. For the sake of conscience. Not your conscience, but his. Otherwise, why would he have informed you? And so you see this thing that Paul is dealing with here. There's this statement, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. When he says all things are lawful, he is reaffirming Christian liberty. Remember, Peter on the rooftop, don't call anything I have made unclean. He has given us, in Christ, all things needful for life and godliness. Jesus said to the Pharisees, it's not what a person puts into his mouth that defiles him, it's what comes out. So he's stating the principle here, all things are lawful, that's true. But he gives these qualifiers in order for a Christian to live in a pagan culture. But not all things are helpful. Not all things build up. You can, in the name of liberty, do a lot of things, but, but are, you, are you helping? Is it helpful? You've heard me say for 12 and a half years that one of the things that kills is killing Christianity in the West is this, is this individualism. That I can do what I want to do, nobody can tell me otherwise, and This is a body. Christ died for the church. And this, this, this preoccupation with my individual rights. I mean, you, surely you, like I, am bemused and befuddled that for the first time in the history of our nation, we have people marching to have rights taken away. That's how, that's how bizarre and confused and lost this culture is. And we need to bring salt and light to it. But it's lost its way completely. Paul says, not everything's helpful. Stop and think. What I'm considering doing, will this, will this help my witness? Will this help those in, whom, in God's providence has placed into my path that I'm, I'm trying to bear gospel influence on. Dawson Trotman, one of the, one of the greatest lines I have ever read in, in studying discipleship since seminary days is, others may, I cannot. Because the devil's lie is this. Well, if they can, why can't you? Well, if it's okay for them, why isn't it okay for you? And if you listen, parents, your children who are exposed to other sinners will ask those kinds of questions. Is it helpful? Is it edifying? Does it build up? 
Is the person really going to be blessed? Is Christ going to be exalted in this? Are they going to taste the sweetness of the gospel of Christ? Are they going to see the preciousness of Jesus? What I'm considering. So, so he says, let no one seek, and I would say primarily, his own good, but the good of his neighbor. When you, when you think and act and speak, it should be for what is good for them. Not what they think is good for them. What, what Scripture says is good for them. So here's what you learn. Liberty should be limited by consideration for the well-being of others. Well, there's a thousand applications for that. We may be free to pursue a given course of action, but we have to ask ourselves, is it beneficial? Is it helpful? Is it profitable? The constructive. One commentator said, does it build up the church? Does it build up character? Will my words, thoughts, actions be inclined to promote in the lives of others their greater inclination to be more like Jesus? Or do my words, thoughts, and actions send the message that it doesn't really matter? The welfare of others. So there's the tension you see. Liberty, the field of liberty, the fence of self-denial. One writer said this, a Christian has the abstract right to do whatever is not in itself wrong, but consideration for the good of others places practical limits on this right. There's the issue. Look at the application of it, verses 25 to 30. He says, eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. If one of the believers invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, we read this a while ago, you see these verses, verses 25 to 30. And so you see that and you see first the question of eating meat purchased in the market. So liberty in Christ with a, with a conscientious endeavor to bless others means that we will have a freedom to go into the marketplace and not superimpose evil upon a matter. It's indifferent in and of itself when it comes to food. It also means that we won't judge others. Brother Norman, I think the term you use is love with accountability and without judgment. That tension there. For Paul and for the Corinthians, when you purchase meat in the market, it's not to be thought of as sacrifice to an idol, but as food provided by a loving God for our use. Then there's also the question of eating sacrificial meat when one is a guest in a private home. When you're invited into someone's home, and we've already we went through this back some time ago that we should be the ones doing the inviting, but when you're invited into someone's home, you're willing to go, do not take a list of what you're not willing to eat. <laughs> You're willing to go meet them where they are. Now, I've told you I grew up in a climate, and I'm not, going, I'm not going to assign blame or fault to anybody. This was the climate, though. I'm a Baptist. Oh, Baptist. Man. Yeah, we, well, what, what about, well, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. I didn't, I wasn't really good at what we did. But we didn't. There's a whole list of what we don't. We don't. And it, and it really, it cultivates a climate of, of legalism, of Phariseeism. That, that, uh, some, of the, some of the most precious believers in history were the Puritans. Glory of God. I mean, just saturated with that. 
but they got a bad rap. And so this caricature of Puritanism comes out of, oh, the, yeah, the Puritans. They're, they're the folks who sit around constantly concerned that somewhere someone might be having fun. That's, that's not Puritanism, but there's, there's a reason for the caricature. And people caricature us, folks, because they think when you come to Jesus Christ, you hang up joy at the, at the door. No, we don't. We enter into joy. We make the main things the main things. And Paul's trying to get these Corinthians in a, in a terribly pagan climate to maneuver through this in a way that Jesus Christ shines through. That's the only hope of, of a pagan Corinthian. So if an unbeliever invites you to dinner, you're disposed to go. In other words, if you, if you have liberty to go, eat whatever's set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, if there's someone at the dinner, so you go, you're, you go with good intentions, and you sit down and someone says, uh, uh, this, this meat, now, who would it be? It could be, could be another pagan Corinthian who knows that Christians have come out from the world, that they're to be uh, in the world but not of it. It could be that, a, that another brother has been invited and he's a weaker brother, he, he's got scruples about these things, but he's gone, and someone says, that's why the, when you read some of the commentaries, they say, and the, and the informant says, they don't sign assign motive to the informant, someone <laughs> informs and says, this has been offered in sacrifice. Then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informs you and for the sake of conscience. So you're in a dilemma, but there's a way through it. You simply, without judging, say no thank you. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation before or not, but I, I found myself in these situations in, in witness and ministry where someone offers me a beer. Now, I don't draw conclusions, <laughs> wrong conclusions about what I'm about to say. But uh, for reasons I won't go into today, you couldn't pour a beer down my mouth with a gun to my head. I mean, it's just, there's just reasons. About, but the Lord's having me to grow up and say, no, thank you. Rather than, what's it, how could you dare offer me such filthy stuff? That gets us nowhere. It's just, no, no, thank you. No, thank you. You simply don't. You don't make a big deal about it. You just don't. If you know that behind that is operating something that would bring reproach upon a witness. Let me say parenthetically, so the devil doesn't get into somebody's head here. I didn't just tell you you shouldn't drink beer. I told you you can't get me to do it, all right? You shouldn't get drunk. I'll go to the mat on that. Anybody who puts any substance in their body, whether it's the temptation to a sugar high or any other kind of high, wrong, sinful. Scripture says so. Excess, sinful. Paul says you just politely abstain. No, thank you. And you do that because someone at the table has pointed out something that now makes another issue superimposed more important than the issue of simply eating meat that was bought in the marketplace. And it's the, it's the identity. Who do you identify with? So the principle here is, is what I'm thinking about doing, saying, does it, does it lift up Jesus Christ? Does it magnify the, the glory of God in the gospel who came to save sinners? Jesus' name, is, he will save his people out of their sin. Am I going to bring reproach upon Jesus for this? If what we do Shocks, clouds, you know, others may. I cannot. I cannot. This is, F.F. Uh, Bruce wrote this, and I thought this was helpful. But imagine if someone with strong principles on total abstention 
from alcohol were the guests of friends who did not share these principles. In other words, there, you have a, we used to call them growing up a teetotal, uh, uh, sitting in a home. He would be well advised not to inquire too carefully about the ingredients of some especially palatable sauce or trifle. <laughs> What was put in, the, what, 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 this, what was made with this? But if someone said to him pointedly, there's alcohol in this, you know, he might feel that he was being put on the spot and could reasonably ask to be excused from having any of it. But he's avoided unwitting compromise without coming across as judgmental. Oh, thanks, but no thanks. Then there's two questions Paul asks in verses 39 and 29 and 30. I do not mean your conscience, but his. Why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I being denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So Paul puts himself in the position of the Christian guest who's been placed in a difficult spot by the informant. In other words, Paul saying, what good end will be served by me eating under these circumstances and exposing my freedom to the censure of an unsympathetic conscience? How will this, how will this turn out good for me? It's implied that nothing is to be gained by insisting on one's liberty under these circumstances. I heard a story, one of my evangelism professors in seminary was at the Baptist World Alliance over in Europe, Germany, France, somewhere. And this was a godly, godly man. And a, and a German Baptist missed the opportunity to apply this principle big time. Dr. Roy Fish was there. They were, they'd gone out to lunch together. They were sitting at a table and uh, asked what they wanted to drink. And Dr. Fish said, I'll have tea. The German Baptist had ordered a stein of beer, and he looked at Dr. Fish and he said, tea? Why tea? Dr. Fish said, well, uh, in America, Baptists don't drink beer. Of course, he was, he was fudging a little bit at that point, but he was basically stating a principle that was generally true. The German Baptist looks at him and says, hmm, I'm glad I'm a German Baptist. And he quaffed his stein. Now, according to the principle here, he, he could have taken a little different approach on that, not causing anyone to stumble. Paul says, why should I let myself be denounced for eating what I thank God for? So there's the tension. You may not find yourself there, but you need to be sensitive to it. And because what it does is it, it challenges us not to be judgmental toward others, but to be consciously aware of what, what message am I sending of my witness to Jesus Christ, that I belong to Jesus and Jesus belongs to me. And I'm not my own, I've been bought with a price. So he sets that before them. The second thing he points to, here's the principle of God's glory in verses, verse 31. So now, so, so that's a, he's kind of taking the ball of 23 through 30, which is actually taking the whole of 8, 1 through 10, 22. He says, so, whether you eat or drink, by the way, which we all do, I think it's, it's interesting that Paul uses that. He could have used something that's not common to all of us. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, what should drive us? Do all to the glory of God. This word glory here speaks of brightness, of splendor, of radiance, of honor. That's the, whatever you do, honor God. So when people have encountered you and they leave the encounter, they're challenged. You can't make a person think but they're challenged to think more highly of God. Or in some cases, just challenged to think about God. Do you realize how, how many people in this culture never give a meaningful thought to God? You have them thinking about God. Hmm. 
You mean there's a, there's a force that influences your decision making? Yeah. I'm accountable. I want the smile of God upon my habits. I want the smile of God upon my labors. I want the smile of God upon my lips, upon my words. Eating and drinking and anything has got to be subordinated to this principle of glorifying God, of reflecting the preciousness of God, of demonstrating that we realize we live as creatures made in the image of God, that we, as Paul says to the, to the folks in Acts 17 on the, at the Areopagus on Mars Hill, in whom we live and move and have our being. It's good every now and then to do this. Well, I, I do it from time to time. I want everyone to just focus and do this. This is a little drill, quick drill. Inhale, exhale. Thank God. Because you did that by His permission. Your lungs are enabled to take in oxygen, to exhale carbon dioxide, which keeps everything flowing. You've, you've seen it. I've seen children who get mad. They're going to hold their breath, and they, they hold their breath in, and they start turning red, maybe, I don't know, blue, different shades, and then what? They pass out. And what do they do when they pass out? They start breathing. God allows that. He allows that. We live and move and have our being in Him. And because, because He is that intimately involved in our very existence on this planet, then we must do all His glory. Now, we don't. That's the good news of the gospel. When we discover we don't, we repent. We're forgiven. We pray for strength. We pray for the enabling of the Spirit to, to give us the grace to battle that remaining sin. To slay that, not even thinking intentionally about these things. Just go about our merry way. We come back to that again and again and again. And as you do, by the way, you're building some spiritual muscles. And when you build spiritual muscles, then, then there's, there's a thought process that begins to take place and shape. And again, not perfectly, not perfectly. We're not in heaven. But more intentionally, more regularly, more powerfully, thinking of God's glory and the good of others. Charles Hodge in his commentary said, let self be forgotten. Well, that's easy to say and it's tough to do. Let self be forgotten. Let your eye be fixed on God. Let the promotion of his glory be your object in all you do. Strive in everything to act in such a way that men may praise God whom you profess to serve. Jesus said it this way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The Hebrew writer said it this way, since we're encamped about by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race that's been marked out for us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We were never called to skip daintily through the tulips. We're called to run with endurance this race. And how many do you know today who seem to have begun doing this, who are not now. It's a tragedy. Third thing I want you to see is the example of Christ. Paul says, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. He's talking about there, don't be, don't be odd for God. Don't be an offender for a word. I've told you, I've got a friend, and I won't, I won't say where he is because he may be, he may listen to our sermons. But 
He's as likely as not to walk up to somebody he may have never met, engage them in a conversation and say, do you believe in election? When we talk on the phone, I go, oy vey, you didn't tell them you knew me, did you? Offender for a word. Picking a fight. No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about that the gospel is offensive enough. <laughs> you don't believe it. Talk to somebody about God sending his only son to come and live this earth perfectly in the midst of sinners and then dying at the hand of God and rising three days later to uh, show that God saves sinners. By the way, this is one of the two times of the year, Christmas and Easter, when the atheists get out their billboard things. Watch for, watch for atheist billboards if you hadn't seen them. And what we're doing is a waste of time. We're just under some sort of sedation. There is no hell. Da, 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 da. Just talk to somebody about the death, burial, and resurrection, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and watch the response you get. The gospel is offensive. We don't need to be acting offensively. We need to be winsome. We need to live lives that are compelling. We need, to, we need to be the best husbands we can be so that husbands whose wives are wilting under their care might look at us and say, okay, what's the deal? The best wife that you can be so that wives are, who are like dripping faucets driving their husbands to a rooftop might look and say, what is the deal? Parents who raise their children, by the way, children, children here who were here yesterday, thank you for sitting still. It was an amazing, refreshing difference. Thank you. You do that every week here, and I thank God for that. You don't tend to thank God for that until you see what could happen. Thank you, children. Parents who are raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Took, uh, I told you last week, Joanna was in town for spring break for Davis to be at a uh, hockey camp. I was there one afternoon, his coach comes up to me, he knew I was his grandfather, and he said, he said, he is so <laughs> well behaved. I, I didn't say, well, that's, we have a couple different perspectives on that, but I know what you're trying to say here. He said, if he, want, he asked me, coach, can I do such and such? And I thought, no, he says, yes, sir. Sir, he said, I don't hear that from other children. I sat in the locker room one afternoon, and I can tell you he was speaking absolute truth. Raising the children against the, the grain of the culture. You see, the, we, can, we can be winsome and compelling, and the, the, by the way, the world's going to hate you for it. Because if what we believe is right, then what they believe is wrong. Paul says, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do. Now, you know good and well, Paul's not a man pleaser. He stood before kings. Do what you must do to me. Jesus Christ is right. He, he lost his best friends when he confessed faith in Christ. They spent, according to Acts, they swore a vow that they would not eat until they had his head. Now, I'm guessing they either broke their vow or a bunch of them starved to death. He lost his friends. The gospel cost him everything, and yet he gained Christ. And so he said everything else was rubbish <laughs> compared to what I gained. I try to please everything and everything I do, not, not seeking my own advantage. I don't do that to be well thought of. Paul the apostle, good fellow well met? No. Dr. Feelgood? No. But I'm seeking the advantage. I'm trying to be loving and kind toward everyone I meet in order that they may be saved. If you, if you know Paul, you know the, the letters in the New Testament, it doesn't surprise you. He says in Romans, I could wish myself condemned, cut off, accursed of God if my being cast into hell would mean the salvation of my fellow countrymen. 
The example of Christ. So let's think, wrap it up. Am I consciously, intentionally, increasingly thinking what I think, saying what I say, doing what I do for the well-being of other brothers and sisters in this congregation? Last night you had a decision to make. Another one this morning. Am I going to get up in the morning and gather with the people of God because I know that God would have me do that but also to bless those who will be there? In other words, will my absence prove a stumbling block if I'm able to be there? Will my absence be a hindrance? Will my absence send a message that it's, it's a thing of indifference? Or can I, by my commitment to biblical principles, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, commit to be there, whether it's easy or difficult, by the way, if you've lived any time at all <laughs> and followed Christ at all, you know, the devil makes Sunday one of the most challenging mornings of the week. Karen and I were talking about the other day. We used to get our kids Saturday nights. All right, check. Shoes, check. Socks, check. Pants, check. Underwear, check. Shirt, check. Skirt, check. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. All right, good. Sunday morning. I can't find my... How can you not possibly find... I saw them last night. Right, he has an interest in you missing service. Am I doing this for the good of others? Am I conscious that I need to act in such a way, speak in such a way that others, other believers in, in my family, my Christian family, are blessed? Am I doing this for the glory of God? My conduct, my words, my deeds, my, are, they, are they an outshining of a life transformed by His gospel? Dead, alive. Dark, light. Prison, free. Unborn, born. Is, is my life reflecting that? And finally, am I consciously just trying to exemplify Jesus Christ to those under my charge, those, those around me in my neighborhood, and those in my church family? Am I? Paul says, I've told you all of this. I've spent chapter 8, verse 1, through chapter 10, verse 33, because... I'm doing everything with my power while I live to imitate Jesus Christ. The words mim mimitos, to mimic Him. Folks, the, the, the disciples of Jesus were called Christians not because they formed the Christian church. They were called Christianos because Christianos meant little Christ. It was, it was a pejorative Oh, have you, have you tried out the Christian church? No, those, those Christiano. Those people who think they're, they're little Christs. That's what happened in Antioch. Paul says, as long as I have breath, I, wanna, I want people to encounter me and think more of Jesus. And he's not giving a hierarchy here. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. He said, I'm the, I'm the living fleshly representation. He said, I want to fill up in my body what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ. You can't touch Christ. You can't see Christ. You can't reach him. But you can see me. And I want you to know that I live for Christ. I met him on the Damascus Road. I, I know who he is. And I want you to be like him. I want you to be like him. I want to be like him. I want to know him. I want my life to reflect the power of his resurrection. I want my life to be lived daily dying to things because he died for me. I want to know him. He says, I want you to know him, to reflect him, to be like him, and not live like so many who think that because they've tipped their hat or said a, said a word or something, but that makes them safe multitudes. Not on my word, on Jesus' words. Multitudes. We're going to wake up in eternity stunned that they're going to be cast into hell. Many will say to me in that day, but Lord, but Lord, 
And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Because I don't know people who are not growing more like me. I don't know people who are not transformed by my gospel. I don't know such people. I don't have a relationship. That's the word. I don't have a relationship with such people. But all oh, those who, who live and act and speak and do for the good of their brothers and sisters, for the glory of God, to be more like Christ. He knows those people. <laughs> he will say, come you blessed of my Father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Brothers and sisters, I want to be in that group. I want you to be in that group. I don't want you to be in the group that wakes up in eternity and is shocked having been religious and cast into hell. I don't want that for any of you. I don't want it for myself. Pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we help us to live the full extent and bliss and blessedness of the liberty that is ours in Christ. And yet, Lord, help us to recognize we live in a very libertine and licentious culture that says a lot of things are okay when they're not. It tells us just to, make, just to look out for number one. And you say that you're number one. Oh, God, help us. Help us to practice self-denial. Help us to hear the call of Jesus. You want to come after me? You want to come after me? Deny yourself. Take up your cross today. Help us, God, to take that in. To be an impact. A winsome, compelling, loving, convicted. Have an impact on this world. No matter what it takes. No matter what it costs. Come. Wind of God, and breathe upon us here. Save those who are not yet Christ's followers. Strengthen those of us who are. And we may persevere to the end and hear, well done. Well done. Well done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Stand if